Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we begin with part one of Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do by Peter McWilliams. Read by 770. Ain't nobody's business if you do. The Absurdity of Consensual Crimes in Our Free Country by Peter McWilliams. Mr. McWilliams is an expert on the subject of consensual crimes and the damage that fighting such non-crimes has on society and on the economy and our collective states of mind. Hugh Dowes In Loving Memory of Peter McWilliams, 1949 to the year 2000 When I'm gone, let me go. Don't pull me back to this earth that I've loved and hated so. Wish me well on my journey as I do on yours. And if we meet again, let's leave that in the hands of God. By Peter McWilliams. Peter McWilliams, Rest in Peace. By William F. Buckley, Jr. Peter McWilliams is dead. Age, 50. Profession, author, poet, publisher. Particular focus of interest, the federal judge in California, King George, would decide in a few weeks how long a sentence to hand down and whether to send McWilliams to prison or let him serve his sentence at home. What was the offense? He collaborated in growing marijuana plants. What was his defense? Well, the judge wouldn't allow him to plead his defense to the jury. If given a chance, the defense would have argued that under Proposition 215, passed into California constitutional law in 1996, infirm Californiers who got medical relief from marijuana were permitted to use it. The judge also forbade any mention that McWilliams suffered from AIDS and got relief from marijuana. What was he doing when he died? Vomiting. The vomiting hit him while he was in the bathtub and he choked to death. Was there nothing he might have done to still the impulse to vomit? Yes, he could have taken marijuana, but the judge's bail terms forbid him to do so and he submitted to weekly urine tests to confirm that he was living up to the terms of his bail. Did anyone take note of the risk he was undergoing? He took Marinol a pro-offered legal substitute, but reported after using it that it worked for him only about one-third of the time. When it didn't work, he vomited. Was there no public protest against the judge's ruling? Yes. On June 9th, the television program 2020 devoted a segment to the McWilliams plight. Commentator John Stossel summarized, McWilliams is out of prison on the condition that he will not smoke marijuana, but it was the marijuana that kept him from vomiting up his medication. I can understand that the federal drug police don't agree with what some states have decided to do about medical marijuana, but does that to give them the right to just end run these laws and lock people up? Shortly after the trial last year, Charles Lewandowski, writing in the Ventura County Star summarized the cancer treatment resulted in complete remission but only the marijuana gave him sustained relief from the vomiting that proved mortal. It is being said in plain language that the judge's obstinacy resulted in killing McWilliams. Yes, the Libertarian Party press release has made exactly that charge. McWilliams was prohibited from using medical marijuana and being denied access to the drug's anti-nausea properties almost certainly caused his death. Reflecting on the judge's refusal to let the jury know that there was understandable reason for McWilliams to believe he was acting legally, I ended a column in this space in November by writing, So the fate of Peter McWilliams is in the hands of Judge King. Perhaps a cool thing for him to do is delay a ruling for a few months and just let Peter McWilliams die. Well, that happened last week on June 14th. 
the struggle against a fanatical imposition of federal laws on marijuana will continue, as also on the question whether federal laws can stifle state initiatives. Those who believe the marijuana laws are insanely misdirected have a martyr. He was a wry, mythogenic guy, humorous, affectionate, articulate, shrewd, sassy. He courted anarchy at the moral level. His most recent book, his final book, was called Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do. We were old friends, and I owe my early conversion to word processing to his guidebook on how to do it. Over the years we corresponded, and he would admirably twit my conservative opinions. When I judged him to have gone rampant on his own individualistic views in his book, I wrote to this effect. I cherish his reply. Nice acerbic defense. The supreme put down. Please remember the law of relativity as applied to politics. In order for you to be right, at least someone else must be wrong. Your rightness is only in relation to the other's wrongness. Conversely, your rightness is necessary for people like me to look truly wrong. Before Bach, people said of bad organ music, that's not quite right. After Bach, people said flatly, that's wrong. This allowed dedicated composers to grow and cast the neophytes back to writing how to be happy music. So thank me for my wrongness, as so many reviews of my book will doubtless say. People should read more of a truly great political commentator, William F. Buckley Jr. Imagine such a spirit ending its life at 50, just because they wouldn't let him have a toke. We have to console ourselves with the only comment of the two prosecutors. They said they were saddened by Peter McWilliams' death. Many of us are by his death and the causes of it. On the Right by William F. Buckley Jr. Everything used in this book is from public sources. Stuff that's available publicly is far more frightening than a lot of people realize. Tom Clancy. McWilliams marshals a vast army of antidotes, quotes, statistics, and assertions to argue that America would be a lot better off if we stopped using the force of law to save each other from drugs, alcohol, gambling, pornography, suicide, and sex in its more exotic flavors, New York Times. Peter McWilliams has come up with a reinnovation of government that bring us closer to the ideals of the Founding Fathers, increase our personal liberties, and save an impressive amount of money in the process, USA Today. There's a huge difference between crime and sin, and the government has no business making the former out of the latter, at least not in America. New York, Newsday. It might inspire a song if I can match your mix of humor and seriousness. Brilliant. Sting. The forces arrayed against McWilliams are many and powerful, from the legions of the religious right to the political establishment. McWilliams' book brims with facts, delivering with a gentle sense of humor and spiced with the pithy quotations from sources as diverse as Thomas Jefferson and Joni Mitchell, Cleveland Plain Dealer. Here's a controversial book that contains so much logical thought, it is destined to be roundly ignored by policy makers. Gannett News Service. Just as bootleggers were forced out of business in 1933 when prohibition was repealed, making the sale of liquor legal, thus limiting racketeering, the legalization of drugs would put drug dealers out of business. It would also guarantee government approved quality and the tax on drugs would provide an ongoing source of revenue for drug education programs. An added plus, there would be far less crowding in our prisons due to drug-related crimes. It's something to consider. Abigail Van Buren Recently, there crossed my desk, delicate way of saying free, a book significantly intriguing that breaking the habit of a lifetime, I bought another copy. 
The book is Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do by Peter McWilliams. Newsday, new service. Don't miss a point. In our free country, over 750,000 people are now in jail for consensual crimes. You should also know that another 2 million are now on parole or probation. Over 4 million more will be arrested this year. We will spend 50 billion this year punishing people who have been convicted of consensual crimes, and we will lose 150 billion this year in tax revenue. It's your money, you're paying for it. Phil Donahue. If you want to stop this madness, you may want to begin with reading Peter McMillan's book, a highly readable and entertaining work. Ain't nobody's business if you do, Hugh Downs. Why don't we reconsider the criminalization of consensual activities by adults? Why is opinion considered so far beyond the pale that hundreds of timid elected officials who know all this and privately agree are convinced to the question consensual crime is political suicide? Orange County Register. Using his trademark, clear logic, and simple language, McWilliams points out that freeing the police, courts, and prisons from prosecuting consensual crimes will make available whole armies of fighters against consumer fraud, terrorism, murder, and rape. Dayton, Ohio News. What's the difference between a crime that hurts a fellow citizen and a crime that only hurts the fool who commits it? All the difference in the world, according to Peter McWilliams, Rocky Mountain News. In witty, well-researched pages, McWilliams gives a series of compelling arguments to back up his contention that it is morally wrong to prosecute people for victimless crimes against morality. Detroit News. One more reason to buy this book is for the box quotes on almost every page. One of the greatest collections of funny, hilarious, unusual, and trenchant remarks ever. Liz Smith. So you have your rapist, your strong arm robber, your mugger being released early to make room for someone who took money for sex or smoked dope and what we thought was private, but turned out not to be quite. That doesn't look much like a trade from here. However much you say you're repelled by, say, prostitution, wouldn't you rather meet a hooker than a mugger coming down an alley? Reno Gazette Journal. McWilliams is a New York Times best-selling author since 1967. He has published more than 30 books. He is a man well acquainted with controversy and shows no fear in rushing in where angels fear to tread. Well written and fabulously interesting, Tulsa World. McWilliams makes a strong argument for the elimination of such crimes, providing a history of consensual crimes and their absurdity. The blend of first-person observation, research, and argument makes for a fine and revealing title, Book Watch. I don't expect anyone to agree with all of McWilliams' assertions. Even he admits that. But there is one point you should not overlook. What starts with control of narcotics and sexual activity can spread wherever a majority or powerful minority, often powered by religious zeal, decide it knows what's best for you. Philadelphia news gleaner. How truly revolutionary, libertarian, frightening and funny this book is. Grand in scope and scale, the book is interesting and meticulously researched. Little Rock Free Press. Peter McWilliams has written a book for our times. The quintessential book on the subject of sensual crimes, with public sympathy geared towards harsher sentencing for those who commit felonies, McWilliams demonstrates the absurdity of prosecuting those guilty of victimless crimes. Newport News Press Imposing criminal sanctions on human conduct, which is wholly consensual and does not harm another person or his or her property, is a misplaced and counterproductive act. We violate the premise upon which America was founded. New Orleans Times Ain't nobody's business if you do was nominated for the H.L. Menklin Award. There is no need to read this entire book. While this book is relatively heavy to lift, it isn't heavy reading. 
is broken into dozens of short chapters and is more suited to browsing than to read cover to cover, Seattle Times. This book is about a single idea. Consenting adults should not be put in jail unless they physically harm the person or property of a non-consenting other. This idea is explored in the chapter on Overview, which begins on page 3. After reading an overview, please feel free to skip around. Reading what you find interesting, ignoring what you don't, is my fond hope, of course, that you eventually find your way to Part 5, What to Do. If nothing else, the box quotes on each page, a part of the book written by other people, are worth turning the page for. By the way, the most controversial quote, but an absolutely accurate one, is found in the box on page 9. Thank you for reading. Peter McWilliams I never hurt nobody but myself, and that's nobody's business but my own. Billy Holiday Your book is dedicated by the soundest reason. You'd better get out of France as quickly as you can. Voltaire, 1758 it rankles me when somebody tries to force somebody to do something, John Wayne. Perhaps the sentiments contained in the following pages are not yet sufficiently fashionable to procure them general favor. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom. But the tumult soon subsides. Thomas Paine, Common Sense. January 1776 Nobody can be as amusingly arrogant as a young man who has just discovered an old idea and thinks it is his own. Sidney J. Harris I've been waiting years for someone to write this book. If someone had, I wouldn't have had to. I have simply never understood why people should be jailed for actions that do not physically harm the person or property of others. I have thus always been distinctly in the minority. People I admired and people I abhorred all seemed to agree on this point. I was wrong. I filed my conviction away under something I'll understand when I'm older. Now I am older. It makes even less sense than it ever did. From the mid-60s to the early 80s, although the subject of consensual crimes, mostly referred to as victimless crimes, was occasionally discussed and a number of scholarly tomes were published, some of them quite good. A comprehensive view of the subject for just folks like me never appeared. Once a war on drugs was declared, however, all discussion stopped. One might as well have tried saying something good about the Emperor Hiroshito in 1942. Nice uniform. The image that outraged me into putting my childish notion on the front burner was a cover of news magazine from the mid-1980s. Workers in a cocaine field were piled like firewood, their white peasant clothing red with blood. They had been gunned down in cold blood by American troops. The workers didn't own the fields. They were brought in for the harvest, paid subsistent wages. But was this cover an expose on the dangers of prohibition, a warning about what happens when rhetoric and prejudice become more important in setting national policy than logic and reason. A bold illustration of why military solution is the most destructive oxymoron of all. No, the headline blared, winning the war on drugs. Inside the war on drugs was toted as though the magazine were covering the landing at Normandy. Page after page, article after article, arrest photo after arrest photo, diagrams, maps, bar graphs, pie charts, Today they probably would have included a CD-ROM, like the one-sided reports about Vietnam two decades before. In this original orgy of support, not one word was written to defend the rights of those who wanted to take drugs. Not one voice was quoted, crying in the wilderness, so they want to take drugs, so what? I began researching the topic of this book, hoping desperately it had already been written. Spending several weeks reading Supreme Court decisions, is not my idea of a good time. And then there are those brilliantly written government reports, books actually, with names such as Federal Recidivation Rates, 1989 to 1990, or my bedtime favorite, 
Statistical Abstract of the United States, 1994. Alas, I couldn't find a book such as one you hold in your hands, so I had to write it. I explored every argument I could find opposing the legalization of consensual crimes. Not one of them held up to logical analysis. Not one was supported by history. Every solution was worse than the problem it was trying to solve. Then came the dark part of the research, the terrible fact that laws against consensual activities were destroying lives, our society, our freedom, our safety, and yes, our country. The more I discovered, the more I was reminded of Remy D. Gourmand's comment, the terrible thing about the quest for truth is that you find it. I haven't voted since 1964 when I voted for Lyndon Johnson, the peace candidate, Gore Vidal. You should know the truth, and the truth should make you mad. Aldous Huxley. I hope this new edition of the book causes a sort of controversy caused by asking in 1773, why don't we break from England and start our own country? Or in 1833, aren't slaves human beings and therefore entitled to their freedom? Or in 1963, shouldn't Vietnam have the right to determine its own form of government? It's all a variation of why isn't the emperor wearing any clothes. As Bernard Russell observed, change is scientific, progress is ethical, change is indeductible, whereas progress is a matter of controversy. Throughout the controversy caused by the hardcover edition, I was bayoued by this from Herb Locke. You say what you think needs to be said. If it needs to be said, there are going to be a lot of people who disagree with it or wouldn't need to be said. One of the fears about discussing consensual activities is that if you defend a certain practice, you're often accused of being or doing that. Well, if you're wondering about me, why not assume that I do it all? Yes, you can safely presume that I am a drug-selling, homosexual, prostitute gambler who drunkenly loiters all day with my six wives and 14 husbands making watching pornography while being treated by strange medical practices. You can also assume my motives to be the darkest, most selfish, and pernicious you can imagine. I'm doing it for the money. I have a pathological need for attention. My mother didn't love me enough when I was three. No matter how many times I say that I'm not advocating any of the consensual crimes, someone will, of course, accuse me of recruiting for them all. Although the subject is serious, this book is occasionally funny. I know if I lose my sense of humor about a subject, I am truly lost. Until you lost your reputation, you never realize what a burden it was, or what freedom really is. Margaret Mitchell Call it a quirk in my personality. Call it a defense mechanism. But in my mind, things go from bad to worse, to appalling to absurd to funny. Then they start all over again. This for example from the 1993 World Almanac and Book of Facts. Dorothy Reyes filed a 40 million dollar lawsuit against Texas evangelist Robert Tilton. Says he continued to send solicitation letters to her dead husband promising that God would restore his health. Or take the Reverend Jimmy Swaggard. Every time he slammed his Bible on the pulpit I knew a thousand more consensual crimes were going to prison. When he was caught with a prostitute, he insisted it was the devil's work and asked his congregation to forgive him. Pretty standard Christian hand in a cookie jar response. Not very funny. When he was caught a second time, however he told his congregation, the Lord told me, it's flat none of your business. Amen, Brother Swagger. I look forward to the day when I can be similarly amused by Pat Robertson and Jerry Farwell. If one could only remind Reverend Swaggard of Hyman Rickover's advice, if you're going to sin, sin against God, not against the bureaucracy. God will forgive you, but the bureaucracy won't. Footnote, it's a classic example of projection. The religions that believe most in vigorous proselytizing are the same ones that accuse others of recruiting. What they call witnessing and testifying become recruitment and brainwashing when used by others. When we start deceiving ourselves into thinking not that we want something or need something, not that it is pragmatic, necessary for us to have it, 
but it is more imperative that we have it than it is when we join the fashionable madmen. Joan Didion. That's the trouble, of course. We have taken sins out of God's domain, where they can be forgiven and put them in the domain of law, where they can only be plea bargained. Not only do we attempt to drag personal morality into public arena, we put in the hands of the least efficient organization on earth, government bureaucracy. The only thing that saves us from bureaucracy is inefficiency, Eugene McCarthy pointed out. An efficient bureaucracy is the greatest threat to liberty. How inefficient is a bureaucracy? Well, in Southern California, the government spent four years and $600,000 to produce 25 drafts of a wellness guide. Some bureaucrats' suggestions for wellness. Don't buy something you can't afford. Don't beat, starve, or lock up your kid. Or this letter sent from the South Carolina Department of Social Services. Your food stamps will be stopped effective March 1992 because we received notice that you passed away. May God bless you. You may reapply if there is a change in your circumstances. Increasingly, in utter desperation of a war lost, the enforcement of laws against consensual activities is being turned over to the military. You may recall when Air Force Chief of Staff Curtis LeMay, 1965 comment, My solution to the problem would be to tell the North Vietnamese they got to draw in their horns and stop their aggression or we're going to bomb them into the Stone Age. The problem with declaring war on personal behavior does not harm the person or property of another is that military is not just a bureaucracy, it's a heavily armed bureaucracy. The lighter side of the dilemma is illustrated by this news item. When the Army tested a new air defense gun called the Sergeant York, which designed to hone in on the whirling blades of the helicopter and propeller driven aircraft. It ignored the chopper targets. Instead, the weapon demolished a ventilating fan on a nearby latrine. I didn't make jokes. I just watched the government and report the facts. Will Rogers. In war, the first fatality is the truth. The second and paralleled fatality is the civil rights of all dissenters. How much further can my jaw drop than it did as I listened to Los Angeles Police Chief Daryl Gates testify before Congress that consensual drug users should not be arrested but taken out and shot. His reasoning? The country is at war, and all who use drugs are traitors. A good number of people agreed with Chief Gates. The price of freedom is eternal, and internal. Vigilance and an occasional laugh. Peter McWilliams Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much.